to talk just what they call chew the fat or something like that in this culture, or they used to anyway. That type of talk is permissible unless it becomes excessive because of the problems of the tongue and the fact that you will probably end up saying things that you shouldn't have said because there are things that are prohibited to say. You can't backbite against people. And then finally, what is prohibited? The things that are prohibited in this world are very few. If you take Imam Maddox's position, all that's prohibited, that's it. What is prohibited from eating is carrion, dead flesh, blood, and pig meat, and anything that was sacrificed for other than God. That's it. And then even that, if he is forced to do it, not out of transgression, then there's no sin in that. So you can even eat pig if you have to eat pig, if you're starving. So those are the only things that are prohibited. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in al khamar wal maysir, around sabur azlam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rizum min amri shaytan, fashtanibu, that khamar intoxicants is prohibited. That's it. La taqarbu zina. Don't go near fornication. فَإِنُّهُ فَاحِشَ فَإِنُّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَ وَسَأَسَبِيرَ It's a foul thing and it, it has a bad end effect on the society. Once you allow fornication to just look at the end results, venereal diseases, illegitimate children, the breakdown of family, سَأَسَبِيلَ I mean, that's all the Quran says. It's just, it's a bad road to take. Don't go down that road. Don't slander people. Don't steal. Pretty basic thing. That's what's prohibited. If you want to understand the essence of sharia is that it is a logical set of understandings that enable you to live your life without harming yourself or others. That's the essence of sharia. And I'll give you the essence as the usulis understand it. There are five things or six. Some break the dignity into lineage and honor or name. There are five things. Every single ruling in the sharia, in the sacred law of Islam, is designed to preserve one of these five things. Religion, because that's why you were created to worship God. And so preservation of religion. And the beauty of Islam, even though it's the preservation of Islam, it also demands that Muslims preserve the right for other people to worship in their lands. And that's why the Hanafi and the Maliki fiqh have even supported the Hindus and the Buddhists and every religion to worship as they see fit their God or whatever they worship. So therefore, commanding us to pray is to preserve religion. Commanding us to fast, to preserve religion. All these things, the Hajj, preservation of religion. And then protection of life. And that's why the prohibition of killing, to preserve life. So all the laws that relate to transactions and treating people correctly and things have to do with preservation of life and property because you can create wars and things like that you treat people wrong you do things wrong you end up fighting and things like that so la taqturu nafsan right don't kill a soul that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made sacred right man qatara nafsan bi ghayri haqqin aw fasadin fil ard fa ka'annama qatara an-nas jami'an whoever kills a soul without just do or as a result of brigands and highway robbers and things like that in the earth people that sow corruption in the earth it's as if he's killed all of humanity so the soul is sacred every soul every human soul whether they're jew christian buddhist hindu whatever the soul is sacred and you have no right to take the soul without permission and so those laws that relate in sharia to preservation of life preservation of property of intellect the prohibition of intoxicants is to preserve the intellect that's why they're prohibited because the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Khamru um al khabaith intoxicants are the roots, the, the matrix of so many foul things. And he said that a man will become drunk and end up sleeping with his child or his uh, relative or kill somebody and not even know it. Manslaughter. 50,000 people die every year in the United States because of drunk drivers and people intoxicated. Really, most of the deaths on the road in accidents in America are related to drugs and alcohol. The prohibition of drugs and alcohol. Now, people say, well, we tried that in this country. You know, We tried the temperance movement. The truth is that Muslims, because they believe in it, that it's from God. I mean, if you think it's just, it's not God that's told you not to drink, but you think it's just the government, well, why should I do that if just the government? It's an arbitrary law. Whereas if you really believe this is from God for your protection and preservation, 
then that's a different matter. And that's why the Muslims generally have lived in societies. If you go to Mauritania, it's almost impossible to find alcohol or drunk people because people believe in that and they don't drink for that reason. Yeah, I became Muslim when I was 18. Before that, I haven't touched anything, nothing. And before that, I was just like teenagers in this country, exposed to those things. But you give it up for the sake of God. And so I've lived my entire adult life without ever touching any intoxicant. And I haven't missed it. I'm glad that I didn't. I mean, I'm glad I was protected from all that sorrow and suffering and things related to that. And then also preservation of property, prohibition of gambling, the prohibition of usury, the prohibition of stealing, of theft, of embezzlement, all these type things, is to preserve property. And then the preservation of lineage prohibits fornication, to preserve lineage, and also honor, dignity. That's why it's prohibited to backbite, to slander, to speak ill of people, because they have their name. Their name is sacred. And so you honor people's name by not speaking ill of them. Unless you have a just reason to do that, like in a court of law where you have to testify against somebody, and then that rule is set aside for a greater good. So there's a situational type of ethics here. There's things that override other things. That's why it's permitted to kill somebody who's taken life. So that is the sharia. The sharia is a logical set of principles and precepts. There are a few things that the Quran has legislated clearly. One of them is inheritance. And the reason for that is because one of the things that breaks families apart is the distribution of wealth after the death of a wealthy relative. And so what sharia does, it apportions that. Now, out of the nine categories, six of them are women. The thing about Islam is that women didn't even inherit. In, even in 19th century Britain, women did not inherit wealth. In Switzerland in 1970s, I think, they couldn't even vote. They couldn't vote in Switzerland, women, until like 1980 or something. And that's considered one of the most progressive European countries. But their idea was the family, one vote, one house type thing. And then if you look at the differences, you know, the idea of women getting half of what men, that's not always. There's cases where women get more than the men in the division. But with a daughter and a son, the son gets twice as much. Now, the reason in Sharia, and it's never in the history of Islam, and you can see this in I'lam al muqeen Imam Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyah, which this is 8th century. You look at what the scholars said, 8th, 9th century. They never interpreted this idea that men were better than women or they get twice as much because they're twice as good. Never. It was always understood that the responsibilities of wealth that men have, women do not have. That was understood to be the rationale. That women, الرجال قوامون على النساء, that men have to take care of women, maintain them. It's an obligation. And therefore, they, their money is obligatory, whereas women's money is discretionary. Whatever she earns, whatever she inherits, it's hers. She doesn't have to support anybody or give it to anybody. As long as she pays zakat, that's it. And that's why the Muslim world was filled with very wealthy women over history. Many of them were great supporters of Islam as well, of building mosques and hospitals and universities. The Quran and Sunnah and the historical embodiment, they talk about the madhabs, and I want to go over that very quickly. The basic four Sunni madhabs came out of a recognition that there were many ways to interpret a verse. For instance, the Quran says about divorce that you should wait for three, the word it uses is quru' and qur in Arabic means it's from the adlad which are opposite words it means the time in which a woman is menstruating but it also means the time she's free from menstruating there was no clarification from the Prophet ﷺ about which one it was and so it became an ishtihadi issue some of the scholars said it means the time between periods Others said it meant the time of the period. And there's a reason that we believe that God left it like that, is it forces people to think that part of the reason the Quran was revealed was to force people to use their intellects. We sent down this Quran in order to force you to think. I and mean, that's one of the meanings of that verse, in order for you to use your intellects. And that ishtihad means it comes from jihad to exert one's utmost intellectual endeavor to understand the intentions uh, behind a verse or a hadith. That, that's what ishtihad is. And for that reason, there are multiple interpretations, and therefore the sharia 
is open to interpretation. As long as it is not crazy, what they call ta'wil ba'id, something that is just off the wall, it's unacceptable. But generally, there are many different opinions. Abu Hanifa, anhu, for instance, believes that Muslim and non-Muslim are equated in murder. So if a Muslim kills a non-Muslim, then the Muslim dies. You know, the wulat al dam the people that are responsible for that person. Imam Malik did not. He said that they had to pay the blood money. So th- that's a difference of opinion. You get those types of difference of opinion in the Sharia, and those are all open to discussion and debate. I think a very interesting section here, which is jurisprudence and politics. One of the things that modern Muslims have really come to believe is that Islam is a political philosophy, which is very interesting because that, at essence, is the claim of Zionism. Uh, Zionism turned Judaism into a political philosophy. And one of the signs of the end of time is the Prophet ﷺ said that you will follow Bani Israel and you will become like Bani Israel. And so just as Bani Israel wanted a Zionist state, there are now modern Muslims that want this thing called an Islamic state. And an Islamic state is the idea that you can force people to be good Muslims which is a completely insane idea. It's never existed and it will never exist. If you think religion can be legislated by a government, you're completely deluded. It's a delusional state and I have no other word for it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, do you think you can force people to be believers? Do you think you can force people to believe? It doesn't work. Islam is an internal mechanism. The best thing a government can do is to provide as close as possible a court system that is not open to briberies and not open to... But even the Prophet ﷺ said, out of three judges, two go to hell, which is bad odds. And that is why traditionally Muslim scholars never wanted to be judges. And that is why all four of the imams were completely apolitical. They were not involved in politics. The only political stand that Ahmed ibn Hanbal took was actually not a political stand. It was related to Aqidah because he declared openly that the Quran was uncreated because the Mu'tazilite had convinced the ruling party that the Quran was created and it was just a stupid period. People did some really stupid things. But that's Abu Hanifa refused to enter into politics and was imprisoned for it. Imam Malik, if you read the entire Mudawwana, does not have one political statement. He was once accused of sympathizing with Muhammad Nafs Zakiyah, who was one of the family of the Prophet that led a rebellion in the Hijaz. But there's no, he didn't have political positions. All he was doing was teaching Sharia. If you want to learn it and apply it, marhaban. If you don't, good luck in the Akhirah. And that is the way the religion has to be. It has to be free of politics. Once the scholar becomes engaged in the political process, he's corrupted by it. Because that's the nature of the world. It's a corrupting element. And so you don't want religion to be tainted by the temporal. You always want religion to have that atemporal quality to it. And that's why Islam did not create a priesthood or create an ecclesiastical society. The idea is that every believer should try to be as close to God as he can or she can. So you don't want a group of priests dictating for you things. No, and the scholar, anybody can become a scholar. There's no ordainment. Scholars, if they're really rooted and trained, can have difference of opinion. So there's no official church theory. You know, the Pope says, no, you all have to agree with me. No, the ulama differ. One of them says this, another says that. And people are deemed intelligent enough and with enough common sense to be able to discern right and wrong in a healthy society. This modern concept is really an unfortunate. It's just had a really bad effect on the Muslims because what happens is if if these guys get into power, they'll be just as bad as the previous government, if not worse. And it's as simple as that. They'll create the same intelligence mechanisms and they'll do the torture and they'll do all this. They'll do the same thing. Simple as that. And if you don't think this country has it, we have it just doesn't happen in the same way. Now, the School of the Americas, I mean, that's what they did. They train people to torture and do all that stuff. But they do it in South America. They do it in the Middle East. I mean, that's why some of these Qaeda guys, they, they want to interrogate them 
in other countries. <laughs> right? So they can put the electrodes on and do all that stuff and feel good about it because it didn't happen inside the United States. You know, fuqaha can become like lawyers everywhere. Jurists know how to manipulate the law for their own ends, and there have always been jurists who would sell their skills to the powers that be. Every king has had an official mullah or two who was willing to issue whatever Islamic edicts were necessary for the government to function in the way the king desired. So it still goes on. 